Buonasera a tutte le persone che ci seguono dai canali di Ago Modena Fabbriche Culturali e anche dalle pagine di Città di Modena e Fondazione di Modena. Oggi è il secondo appuntamento della prima stagione di Ago dedicata al tema trasmissione. Dopo la lezione di Jeffrey Schnapp di ieri sera, questa sera eh, il percorso ci porterà in una storia ancora del libro di lunga durata, una storia della biblioteca che risale all'epoca alessandrina e a un contesto pre-codex, cioè prima eh, dell'avvento del libro impaginato secondo la forma del codice. È una storia che ci conduce anche in un grande sogno, un sogno di totalità, di possesso universale del sapere, sogno che oggi ha nel digitale, diciamo così, la sua ultima incarnazione, anche se il termine non è tanto adatto per una cultura dell'immateriale come la nostra. È anche un incontro che ci farà riflettere sul ruolo delle biblioteche come istituzione di conservazione e di ricerca e non da ultimo come perno di grandi trasferimenti di saperi e di culture, per esempio quella greca nel quadro delle politiche culturali dei Tolomei. Questo è un aspetto molto importante perché noi sappiamo che la trasmissione che è oggetto dei nostri incontri non è solo e forse non è prima di tutto un processo tecnologico ma è un processo di scambio culturale che avviene nel tempo mediante la custodia del sapere ma anche nello spazio attraverso i contatti tra le culture, la loro ibridazione o ossia secondo dei meccanismi molto complessi di appropriazione, di reinterpretazione e di negoziazione dei canoni. Per fare questo sono molto felice che abbia accettato il nostro invito di tenere un intervento nel nostro programma. Abbiamo appunto invitato Robert Danton, storico. Eccolo, buonasera, buonasera professor Danton, benvenuto, eh, benvenuto di nuovo a Modena dopo qualche anno. Robert Danton è professore emerito dell'Università di Harvard, dove è anche bibliotecario emerito. È uno sicuramente dei principali storici del libro sul piano internazionale, ha eh, condotto molti lavori, molti dei quali pubblicati in italiano, soprattutto dalla casa editrice Adelphi, sulla storia culturale, sociale e materiale del libro e diciamo così delle imprese editoriali, in particolare nell'illuminismo eh, e nella Francia illuministica, uno snodo centrale del rapporto tra eh, imprese editoriale e costruzione dell'opinione pubblica e delle culture politiche di riferimento, che è forse la ragione per la quale nel suo percorso di studi è poi arrivato a porsi la questione del rapporto fra digitalizzazione e democratizzazione del sapere ed ha anche promosso la creazione di una biblioteca digitale d'America Open Access. Io sono davvero felice che sia con noi, gli cedo immediatamente la parola per tenere il suo intervento, la lezione sarà eh, eh, diciamo tradotta in, con un'interpretazione simultanea dal nostro Maurizio Boni che saluto e ringrazio. Prego. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I'm flattered to be asked by uh... I'll go again. Uh, it's a good cause, the cause of libraries. And uh, what I'd like to do would be to put it in perspective by emphasizing in particular the library of Alexandria and trying to show how that provided a kind of model or at least a, a, an ambition for a universal digital library. Um, in fact, if you look back over the history of libraries, it seems to be the pursuit of a utopian dream, an attempt to make all knowledge available to all humanity. But of course, uh, as Borges reminds us in his famous story, The Library of Babel, <coughs> that dream can turn into a nightmare that is information overload as a terrible labyrinth in which you can be lost and crushed. Another of Borges's stories, The Book of Sand, warns that a fantastic book of 
books, a book that contained all of the other books between its covers um, has was found, read, and was so oppressive that its owner hid it in the National Library of Buenos Aires. The librarians there still haven't found it, they have told me. So what I'm saying is, of course, this utopian dream can turn into a nightmare. The history of libraries is in part a history of destruction, of devastation, but nevertheless, there is, I think, a positive connection between libraries and utopias going back to the beginning. Well, from what little we know about the Library of Alexandria, it embodied both the bright side and the dark side of the history of libraries. In its popularized version, and I'm sure uh, most of the people listening or watching now know about it, it calls up a romantic vision. The greatest library that ever was, all knowledge from antiquity packed into one palatial space. And then a tragic ending. Fire set by none other than Julius Caesar. Trapped in Alexandria by a superior force, he torched his ships in the harbor as a tactic to repel an assault before re reinforcements arrived to save him. So Hellenic culture went up in flames. Many of the greatest works of philosophy and literature were irreparably lost. From that conflagration, only the ashes remained. And today we cannot even locate the site where the great library stood. Well, that version of events is wrong but it conveys a compelling vision, widely accepted as historical truth. Taken as a legend, it can be read as a cautionary tale about the history of libraries and their role in shaping the world of knowledge. On the bright side, it represents the aspiration to bring together all the knowledge in the world. On the dark side, its destruction feeds into lamentations about cultural catastrophe. For example, the common view, and I'm sure you've heard it, that a book is dead. That is, electronic devices have taken its place, trivializing the very act of reading. Or another common view, Libraries are obsolete. No one goes there anymore. Now, those views are absolutely wrong. And at the same time, I think they are revealing a history of cultural Jeremiah's, if it could be pieced together, would expose the unease of intellectuals faced with changes in the means of communication. In 1928, Walter Benjamin declared, quote, everything indicates that the book is nearing its end, end quote, 1928. And about the same time, Ezra Pound prophesied, quote, the art of letters will come to an end before AD 2000, end quote. More recently, Alvin Kernan, a great Shakespearean scholar, devoted an entire book to the death of literature as its title went. So prophecies of doom, they can be detected far back into the past, along with other symptoms of disorientation, such as information overload. That's a term that, as Ann Blair has shown, was uh, invented in the 16th century. So. There is a general feeling uh, that is, has existed for centuries among humanistic scholars of being overwhelmed by printed texts. Now, of course, historians
can often find instances in the remote past of present day phenomena that are taken to be unprecedented. To detect continuity in place of change is one of the tricks of the historian's trade. And in fact, I think a misplaced sense of continuity should not blunt our understanding of what we all feel, I certainly feel, is the unparalleled transformation of the information environment in the recent past. It took two millennia to advance from the invention of writing, which took place around 4000 BC, to writing with alphabetical characters. That was something that happened, we don't know exactly when, but about 2000 BC, and this in the Western world. Then another two and a half millennia went by before the advent of printing on paper with movable type. And after that, the technology of printing hardly changed for three and a half centuries after Gutenberg. To be sure, the Chinese and the Koreans invented paper and printing long before the breakthroughs in the West. But in Asia, as well as in Europe, the basic innovation in the technology of communication belonged to a longue durée, measured in many centuries until the very recent past. The pace of change in our own lifetimes has been staggering. The internet, 1974, the World Wide Web, 1991, and then one breakthrough after another. Search engines, algorithmic relevance ranking, smartphones, social media. Looking backward across all those changes, one could ask whether the Library of Alexandria should be considered as a kind of turning point uh, in the history of information. Well, insofar as that question turns on technology, the answer is no. The library's holdings consisted almost entirely of papyrus scrolls, and it contributed little or nothing to the most important technological change of its time. That is, the shift during the first two centuries of the common era from the volumen or scroll, which one read by unrolling, uh, to the codex, a book made up of sheets folded and bound together, which one reads by turning pages. Yet, the Library of Alexandria stands out as a monument in the history of knowledge. Although it came to an unhappy ending, but not Caesar's fire, and although it left little evidence of its existence, it began as a breathtakingly ambitious attempt by the Ptolemaic rulers of Egypt to collect and preserve everything known to man. From the beginning of their 300 rule, year rule over Egypt, the Ptolemies made the Library of Alexandria an expression of their grandeur. They invested enormous resources into building up its collections, sending agents to purchase books on every conceivable subject from every imaginable source. According to Galen, the great Greek physician, the kings ordered each ship that docked in Alexandria to be searched for books. If any were found, they were sent to the library and copy. Then the copies were returned while the library kept the originals. Galen also reported that the third king of the Ptolemies asked to borrow the original manuscripts of Sophocles, Aeschylus, and Euripides from Athens. The Athenians agreed, provided that Ptolemy III deposit an enormous treasure as a guarantee that he would return them. Well, he had the manuscripts copied and then sent back the copies in place of the originals telling the Athenians to keep their treasure. 
The ambition of the Ptolemies was to create a universal library by acquiring the text of every book in the world, that is the Western world. They had no idea of the parallel tradition of literary scholarship in ancient China, where combinations of knowledge and power also supported great dynasties. So if you look back on this with a critical modern eye, you could interpret this library policy as a form of what we call soft power, or even as one authority put it, cultural imperialism. By collecting all the books in the world, the Ptolemies tried to assert their dominion over classical Greek civilization and to create a monument to their dynasty that would last forever. It was their version of the pyramids. Now that view, I must admit, involves a good deal of speculation because we have little hard evidence about the actual functioning of the Library of Alexandria. Although it's often mentioned by contemporaries such as Plutarch and Galen, it eventually disappeared without leaving a trace of its existence. Um, and much of the research about it concerns the problem of its extinction. It probably did suffer from the fire set by Julius Caesar during his brief conquest of Egypt in 48 to 47 BC. He arrived in Alexandria with a small army in order to resolve a dispute over the throne between Cleopatra and her brother, Ptolemy XIII. Soon, Caesar became entangled both with Cleopatra, who apparently was irresistible, and with Ptolemy XIII, who lay siege to the city and began to close in on Caesar's forces. They were located in the city center near the great library. Before reinforcements arrived, Caesar, who was desperate at this point, stopped Ptolemy III by a tactical maneuver, which involved burning the Roman fleet. The fire may have reached the smaller so-called daughter library of the Serapeum, but the main library was spared. After Egypt was incorporated as a province in the Roman Empire, the library in Alexandria remained intact, but it received progressively less funding and it went into decline. Its demise probably occurred in 272 AD during a civil war which destroyed the area inside Alexandria known as the Brucheion, where the library was located. Reports by later travelers indicate that nothing remained but ruins by the end of the fourth century AD. Now, what little we know about its holdings mainly comes from notes made by monks when they copied classical texts during the Middle Ages. These references indicate how much from classical antiquity has been lost. In the case of Euripides, for example, contemporary evidence shows that he wrote 92, perhaps 95 plays. All of them probably were included in the library of Alexandria, yet only 18 or possibly 19 have survived in their entirety. So yes, the loss of the library was a catastrophe, even though it didn't happen all at once in one great bonfire. Still, the library had existed for 600 years, making its collections available to visiting scholars and dominating the world of knowledge. Th that is throughout the Hellenistic age, quite a record when compared with modern libraries, uh, except of course, the University Library of Oxford, which is now a century older than its Alexandrian predecessor and is still going strong. 
we know little about the appearance and the internal organization of the Library of Alexandria. Various sources indicate that it was a main ingredient of a so-called museion or museum, a combined school and research institute located near the royal palace in the heart of the city of Alexandria. The name museum evoked its dedication to the muses whom it honored with a shrine. It was divided into rooms which corresponded to subject matter and contained the scrolls arranged alphabetically according to the first letter of the author's name. So there is a very carefully worked out system of a kind of, well, cataloging, if you want to call it that. But it was not a public library. Far from admitting ordinary subjects of the king, the library and the museum as a whole served as, well, you could call it an institute for advanced study, if you will forgive that anachronism. Uh, there were 30 to 50 resident scholars who received salaries, were given tax exemptions, enjoyed free board and lodging, and took meals together in a common dining room. They occasionally gave lectures, taught classes, or directed symposia, for the museum did have a pedagogical mission. The head librarian, a scholar appointed by the king, served as tutor to the heir to the throne and also as a priest at the shrine to the muses. Colonnades, porticos, covered walkways, and a garden provided a setting for a peripatetic uh, discussion in the style of Aristotle's Lyceum and Plato's Academy. One resident scholar, Callimachus, created the first comprehensive catalog of Greek literature, organized by genre and the alphabetical order of the author's names. Whether it determined the organization of the collection physically, we don't know but a catalog must have been required to integrate acquisitions and to locate the material. Galen indicates that after the books arrived, they were given tags indicating their origin and previous owners. So it seems likely that the catalog contained information that we today would call metadata. The collection was gigantic. It probably contained 400,000 scrolls. One estimate puts the total as high as 700,000, covering the entirety of classical Greek literature, philosophy, and science, along with a great many foreign works, which were translated into Greek by the scholars of the museum. Apparently, these resident scholars enjoyed a pleasant, well-subsidized life, at least during the early years of the library when funds flowed freely. They were said to consume a good deal of alcohol, and they organized games and festivities among themselves. Inevitably, they aroused the jealousy of wits and sophists outside Alexandria. One of their critics, Timon of Phileas, dismissed them with an acid one-liner, quote, in populous Egypt, many cloistered bookworms are fed, arguing endlessly in the chicken coop of the muses, end quote. Well, does this story, familiar to classicists, yield any fresh conclusions? From the perspective of library history, I think two points stand out. First, the Library of Alexandria represents the culmination of a shift in antiquity from a literature based on oral transmission to one based on script. Xenodotus, its first librarian, was also the first to edit Homer's epics 
and in collating texts, he divided them into books or chapters, adapting them to the eye rather than the ear. Second, the library expressed the ambition to bring all knowledge together and by doing so to exert mastery of everything known. That ambition is still with us. It did not originate in Alexandria, however. In 1849, archaeologists discovered a collection of 30,000 cuneiform clay tablets at Nineveh in northern Iraq. The tablets were assembled, assembled by Assurbanipal, an Assyrian king from 668 to 627 BC, who is now celebrated among library historians as the creator of the first systematically collected library, or even as some put it, the first national library in the Western world. But he wasn't the first. More recent excavations in Uruk in southern Iraq have turned up the oldest written documents known anywhere in the world, 4,500 tablets. They date from sometime between 3,400 and 3,000 BC, soon after the invention of writing. They were basically word lists, essentially accounts used to keep track of objects and possessions, and they were curated and archived. That is, they belonged to something that could indeed be considered a library. By 2900 BC, Uruk had develop, developed into an important city, the largest in the world, with at least 50,000 residents. It produced what some consider as the first great work of literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which dates in its earliest version from 2100 BC. So the history of libraries goes back 5,000 years. It is congruent with the history of literature and indeed of writing itself. The Library of Alexandria was actually a latecomer in this history, but it certainly expressed an ancient ambition to gain mastery over the world by collecting everything knowable in the form of writing. Well, we are still at it. In 2004, Google set out to digitize all the books in the world. It began with us at Harvard, and indeed we gave it access to our collections, which are the largest collections of any university library in the world. But when Google asked us to digitize books covered by copyright, we said, no, we were not about to break copyright law. But then Google went to the University of Michigan, to Stanford, to the University of California, and they agreed. So Google began digitizing everything, including books covered by copyright, and therefore immediately it was sued by the Association of American Publishers and the uh, Authors Guild. Then, um, well, three and a half years of secret negotiations took place to see if they could arrive at some kind of settlement. They uh, eventually did, but unfortunately the settlement transformed what originally was a search operation, Google specialty, into a commercial library. The original idea, I think, was terrific. Google would let uh, searchers, people like you and me, know uh, what books were available, where they could locate them, and it gave them little snippets, just tiny bits of text. So it was a great service in uh, helping people locate bits of knowledge. 
The settlement, however, transformed that search service into a kind of library uh, that would force us, the libraries who had originally given, made our books available to Google, to buy back our own books in digital form at a price that would be set by Google and that could spiral out of control. So Google was creating a monopoly of a new kind, a monopoly of knowledge in digital form. On March 22nd, 2011, the Southern Federal District Court of New York declared this settlement an illegal monopoly in restraint of trade. Therefore, Google Book Search was dead, and it still is dead. You can acquire books through Google, but Google has not created this, this gigantic commercial library. Still, like the Library of Alexandria, it provided an inspiring example. And even before it was declared illegal, it raised a question. Would it not be possible to create a non-commercial library devoted to the public good by linking all the digital holdings in all the major libraries of the United States. All of this for free as a public service. On October 1st, 2010, a group of leaders from foundations, libraries, and computer science met at Harvard. And we discussed the possibility of applying that principle uh, to the world of libraries in the digital age. We immediately agreed that it would be possible to create what we called a digital public library of America, DPLA for short, and we set to work devising a technical infrastructure, a network of contributing libraries, and an administrative center. On April 18th, 2013, the DPLA was launched. Its collections now contain 35 million books and other objects. They come from 4,300 institutions located in all 50 states of the United States, and they are being used free of charge by readers all over the world, except in one country, North Korea. Similar projects also exist because there's now everywhere an attempt to bring things together and to cooperate in making books and other objects like images, videos, even digitized communication to make all of this available free of charge to the public. I will mention four of them. One is actually in Alexandria itself the Biblioteca Alexandrina. It is a superb cultural center completed in 2002, which has a library with 1 million printed books and links to the Internet Archive in San Francisco. It began as a project to build a library for the University of Alexandria. Then it won support from the Egyptian government and from UNESCO, which sponsored it as a modern reincarnation of the ancient library and its mission to include all human knowledge. Unfortunately, it does not have the resources to do so. It collects works only in Arabic, French, and English, and it has been criticized as a project used to make the Egyptian government look progressive, even though the government does not provide enough funds to support it. Second, there is Hathi Trust, that's spelled H-A-T-H-I for elephant, meaning elephant in Hindi. Hathi Trust is a digital repository in Michigan, which contains material from more than 60 
research libraries and provides free access to 5.3 million books in the public domain. Hati Trust began as a collective attempt to solve the problem of preserving digital works, which, as you probably know, is, is very tricky uh, because uh, the ones and zeros in digital uh, texts can unravel. And so we really have great difficulty in solving that problem. But then uh, they, Hati Trust began actually uh, making some of these books available. And I think it has great potential as a means of diffusing books. Third, there is the Internet Archive. That is a gigantic digital lending library uh, produced by Brewster Kale, who is an extraordinary computer scientist from MIT who made a fortune by uh, creating digital companies and then retired to devote himself to open access. His Wayback Machine, as he calls it, has crawled the internet and saved 10 million website pages. And he also devised a way to make copyrighted books available free online, a tricky business. He buys and solicits donations of physical books. He then digitizes them and makes the digital versions available one copy at a time in the manner of a public library lending books. Fourth, there is Europeana. That's a network, as you may know, financed by the European Union, which links digital collections of libraries in many EU countries. It has a rather cumbersome structure and unfortunately the EU does not provide adequate financial support, but it has great potential and its, its technical infrastructure is compatible with that of the Digital Public Library of America. So all of these enterprises must overcome enormous difficulties, notably in the problems of preservation and in overcoming the restrictions of copyright, uh, which makes most books published after 1923 inaccessible. They're not in the public domain for more than a century. Still, we are making progress and in 10 years, I believe we will have an open access world digital library, which will eventually include almost all books in existence. Well, I confess that I have switched from an argument about the past, which does involve some unproven surmises, to a prediction about the future which may seem downright utopian. I think we should take heed of Borges's warnings about utopias. Nonetheless, I would like to close with a conclusion. We have it in our power to realize what was an impossible dream in Alexandria more than 2000 years ago. We should make that dream come true. Thank you. Bene, grazie molto al professor Danton per questo appunto racconto di lunghissima durata che sta tra eh, l'indizio filologico e, e la previsione. Eh, se possibile, se qualcuno fosse interessato si possono porre domande al professor Danton usando la sezione commenti della pagina Facebook di Ago Modena Fabbriche Culturali. Eh, in attesa di eventuali quesiti posso forse porre io una domanda al professore e, di carattere magari tecnico, cioè quali sono le tecnologie più adatte per interoperare i patrimoni bibliotecari digitali per arrivare a questa biblioteca 
mondiale, cosmopolitica, mi viene da dire, che lui ha indicato come una possibilità, mi sembra, nell'arco del prossimo decennio. Right, well, um, interoperability is of course crucial. Now, I'm not a technologist and I can't write computer code, so uh, I can't give you an insider's uh, knowledge about this. However, um, there is one uh, version of interoperability uh, to make books uh, accessible that I think is technologically superb. That's something called Simply E, developed at the New York Public Library. Uh, to, by using this code, uh, you, now it's possible to make uh, electronic books available everywhere very simply. And so you can hook up uh, all thousands of public libraries, as we are doing through the DPLA, using this technology called Simply E. Now, if you ask me to describe the code and the techniques itself, I would disappoint you because I can't do it, but I've followed its success as a trustee of the New York Public Library. And so that's one I would recommend. Grazie molte, grazie molte. A questo punto, non essendoci domande, naturalmente la lezione sarà poi ascoltabile anche nell'archivio che Ago Modena Fabbriche Culturali inizia da questa prima stagione a costruire sul suo canale YouTube. Io credo che possiamo salutarci, ringraziare nuovamente il professor Danton per essere stato con noi. Ci auguriamo di riaverlo anche presto a Modena di persona, vorrà anche dire che questa terribile emergenza sanitaria sarà passata. Io ringrazio tutte le persone che sono state collegate, do appuntamento a domani sera, sempre alle ore 18, con la lezione di Maurizio Ferraris che diciamo farà il punto su alcune categorie ontologiche fondamentali tra il materiale, il virtuale, il reale, l'immaginario e ringrazio di nuovo sia il professor Danton che Maurizio Boni per la sua impeccabile traduzione e auguro a tutti e a tutte una buona serata. Arrivederci.